I have a lot of houseplants. I still do. And one day I realized that one of my houseplants had killed another one of my houseplants. And at first I felt kind of bad because I should have been paying more attention. Um, But it was a vine and it grew around the other one and shadowed it and the plant died of starvation. And then I had another plant like a month later that tried to sink a root into its neighbor. And then I thought, well, there might be a... um, a pattern going on. So I started to do some research and I discovered that plants are horrible. They're murderous. They're in terrible competition with each other. They will kill each other over sunshine happily. Roses. You think roses, why do roses have thorns? The way a ro- wild roses grow is they're sort of floppy. So they grow up and then they flop over And they use the thorns to dig into the plants around them so that they can hold on to those plants and to continue to grow upward. And whatever might be under them, and maybe it starves and dies because it can't get sunlight anymore, well, that's just too bad. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 51 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Doing very well. Very excited this (laughs) week. Uh, Quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Fanfatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, welcoming today's guest author, the wonderful Sue Burke. How are you, Sue? Very well, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Glad to have you here. But uh, just to get things started, for anyone who hasn't read your work or hasn't heard of you, could you let listeners and viewers know more a bit bit more about yourself? Okay. Um... Well, I have three novels out right now, um, Semiosis and Interference, um, and then there's going to be a third book, Usurpation. These are, this is a trilogy about talking plants. Um, <laughs> we can get into that more maybe later. Um, I have another novel called Immunity Index um, that came out a couple years ago. In May, a novel called Dual Memory is coming out. In addition to that, I've written short stories, I do translations, and write all sorts of things. I've actually been writing professionally for 50 years, a full half wow. century. I started very young. That deserves a round of applause. Right? That yeah, really. that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I feel like that kind of dove, dovetails into to a question that I want to ask, which is what was, if you remember, your entry point into literature, reading, um, and then particularly reading sci-fi fantasy um, when you were growing up? The one who got me started in write, reading was my mom because she read books. to She loved to read. And so she read books to us. And I must have been about four or five. And somehow I came to understand that someone was writing those books. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, <laughs> well, I could write a book. Um, and when I learn to read. Um, (laughs) So I was very excited about learning to read, which is a whole nother story. Um, (laughs) So yeah, I always, always wanted to be a writer. Um, I don't remember when I started reading science fiction, but I do remember that in junior high school, what we now call middle school, um, there was a shelf of science fiction books in my school library and I read them all. Um, and they were pretty good. There, um, there was Arthur C. Clarke, Ray Bradbury, Asimov's, a bunch of other things. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and adult f- fiction too, not just for kids. And so I was reading that and just kept going. That's I was cool, always yeah. a fan. Yeah. But I love from like such a young age, you were like, I want to get into writing and just that Because I feel like it takes so long for some people to kind of develop that association between, okay, here's a book that exists and you just kind of think like it it exists in like the ether of 
you know, like literature in general, not necessarily like you can pinpoint, this is a specific person that wrote this book. So I really, I really love that at such a young age, you develop that association. Yeah. And, well, and, and I feel and, like some people <laughs> as adults don't think about that, right? Like, of course, people, exactly. I mean, like, and it's not like a bad thing, like as a casual yeah. reader, you're just like, oh, I'm consuming this fiction, you know? Yeah. Um, I do think though, that it's like the hallmark of someone that's going to go on to write their own when they're like, <laughs> wait a second. There's people someone behind this. this. I'm a people. Yeah. I can make this. Yeah, I love that. All I got to do is learn to read, to write. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. First, I got to learn to read. Then I got to learn to write. And then I got to learn to write well. And then, you know, it'll And then it'll it's get there all eventually. history from there. Yeah. 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 You mentioned that you're, uh, that you're a translator. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, um, specifically because you do Spanish translation, and I live in Ecuador, so it's like I'm really immersed in Spanish language, and I love you know, when little tidbits of people's lives come up like this. So how did you get into translation and specifically what was it about Spanish translation that, that hooked you and eventually evolved into something that you did for work and, and, uh, career wise and all that? Well, I started studying Spanish when I was in, in, well, junior high school and high school. And even before I got married, my husband and I decided we wanted to live overseas somewhere where they didn't speak English. And the only language we knew was Spanish. So we had that. And then it was just a, a matter of, of finding though. something to do. He got a chance to take a job in Spain. And we'd never been to Spain, but we said, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so we did. And um, so we were living there and I was writing um, science fiction by then. And there is a very active science fiction community in, mm -hmm. in Spain. So I started hanging out with those people. And as my language skills got better, um, I started to work with them with translation. Nice. And eventually went and I got a, a master's level certificate in translation. Um, and it became something that I did for money as well as for fun and favors for friends. That's cool though, because you're you're not only immersing yourself in that local science fiction community, which is not an easy thing to do. It's like you go to a different country, everyone's speaking a different language. Even if you know that language, to be able to get involved with the with such a oh, niche they community were like so that. so welcoming. Oh, I can they, imagine. They, well, they welcomed everybody. That. Um, and they were just are glad. The best people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter where you live, no matter what language you speak. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Now, there's something I've always wondered about translation because I've read a few books that have been translated into English from other languages. And, um, you know, especially when it's sci fi fantasy, I feel like a lot of stuff isn't necessarily one to one translation. P things are made up and concepts are different um, from like the everyday world. And I've always wondered how challenging is it as a translator to capture not just the like words of the work, but the like essence, the, the vibe of it while mm -hmm. maintaining a consistent style that translates well to the other language. Um, the, the trick to translating well is not just to understand the other language really well, which you need to do obviously, but <laughs> to understand how to write in English or whatever language you're translating into really well. And what many translators have a problem with is that they think, well, it's my native language. I already know everything about it. Right. You do not. Um, <laughs> I study English to this day, and I've been writing now professionally, as I say, for a half a century. I don't know everything. Um, the more I know about English, the more resources I have for English, and the more I can use them to work with someone else's prose and make that prose sound like they wrote it in English mm -hmm. in the first place. Because I know enough about English that if I want to write in a different style than the way that I tend to, but the way that they would have, then I can do that. Um, made up words, there's just ways, there, there's standard <laughs> ways to do that. Um, okay. And it's one of the fun parts of, of what, we, what we do. Um, and some of that you can lean on other people when um, Lord of the Rings was coming out and they were going to translate it into Spanish. There's a very active Spanish spandom for, for um, that. And they just mm -hmm. went to the fans. Well, how do you say this? How do you say that? And they told them and that's what they did. That's so cool. I love that. Um, so, yeah, when I translate, what I like about translating is that I get to use all my skills to turn someone else's prose into what they would have done. And it's um, just fun to be another writer. 
Yeah, that's so cool because you get to put yourself your your yourself into the mind of another writer and to kind of think like on a craft level, on an imagination level, and you kind of you kind of get to pick apart all these different aspects of their their writing craft and their style and all that, and then try to do your best to adapt it to your native language. And and you mentioned a lot of the fun parts. What were some of the other more difficult aspects of translation in your experience? Um. The the difficult part of translation actually is trying to tra- translate something that's written poorly. That mm-hmm. is actually very hard. Something that's written well, even if it's my specialty is actually historic Spanish. Yep. Besides um, genre literature, like like medieval and and Renaissance Spanish, Baroque mm. Spanish, oh wow, and Baroque Spanish, <laughs> wow. But if it's well written, it's just a breeze to translate, and it's so much fun because that's such playful language. And just yeah, yeah. how many jokes can you cram into your text? Because it's hysterically so cool. funny. So if it's well written. No matter how, it, it's not that difficult. If it's badly written, it's like, oh my God, how do I handle <laughs> yeah. something that doesn't make sense really in the first place? Oh no. Because that, that kind of lines up with, uh, we, we spoke recently to Travis Baldry and he's an audiobook narrator. And he said the same thing. It's like an audiobook, it's like it can only marginally make a bad book better like there's not so much room like if a bad if a book is bad it's not like the audiobook is going to elevate it to another level you might be able to improve it a little bit just because the narrator is able to evoke a certain performance that that attracts the reader and draws them in a little bit more but still it's like if it's a shit book then not (laughs) necessarily it's going to be like oh this is amazing just because someone did a really good translation or audiobook narration or something like that um, I was just really curious. You were talking about like the historical Spanish, like Renaissance era, that kind of thing. Is it like English in terms of like, you can see, uh, like a different era of Spanish in terms of like, we have English and then middle English and old English and that kind of development and progression. Do you see something similar in, in Spanish? It is similar. One difference is that Spanish does not change as fast as English changes, mm, okay. um, which helps somewhat when when you're trying to work on it yeah and so it's probably like the the structural elements of it are pretty are pretty similar over time as as opposed to english which is just a (laughs) there's mm -hmm. no rules it's fine beautiful beautiful (laughs) shit mix like (laughs) yeah i I can't read shakespeare with without footnotes but i can read cervantes who wrote at the same time yeah just fine yeah that's so cool yeah because yeah like trying to explain to like my 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 mother-in-law my father-in-law who are native spanish speakers and trying to learn a little bit of english and being like this language is broken and <laughs> you just kind of have to roll with the punches and like it's uh they, what 12 they, languages they, in a trench coat right that's what i've yeah, been told before so <laughs> and like every every time they try to pronounce something i'm like you're putting way too much effort into it like say it lazier say it lazier <laughs> if you say it lazier it sounds more natural but it's uh <laughs> no it's crazy and um Going back to this uh, this Spanish writing community that you that you found yourself in and and started to do translations for, and now have you now as you've done more work translating Spanish uh, texts, what does that market look like? Like a, a foreign market, at least for us as like Native North Americans, compared to something like the North American market or like the British market and that kind of thing. Um, mostly, it's just smaller. It's mm. it's hard in in genre, at least in Spain, which I know most about, to really make very much money. So yeah. people tend to do that and something else. Um, everyone has a day job, or one guy I know, he, historical fiction sells really well, and mm. so he does yeah. mostly that, and then some some genre stuff. Um, so nobody's getting rich, um, although some of them do okay. Um, and what that does also is gives them the freedom to do a lot of experimentation because if you're not going to make a lot of money, you're not going to lose a lot of money either. Mm. Um, there. And um, so you can see some um, some very interesting experiments. I read a whole a story that was a series of competing articles in an itty bitty regional journal um, in 
and that was the setup. And it was a delight. You would never get it if you had never lived in Spain. But if you were in Spain, this was was just such a little jewel of Spanish. Another book, one of my favorites, um, it's called Madrid by Daniel Mares. And it is set during a soccer riot in Madrid cool. that might bring about the end of the world. Um, <laughs> and then there's all sorts of things that happen. And then at one point, there's actually two parallel columns of text because two things are going on at the same time and you have to know both Whoa. at once. Oh my um, God. He has one Damn. chapter that ends in the middle of a sentence and then it picks up in the middle of that next sentence, but in a different character. Wildly <laughs> experimental. And it Sounds works. It's beautiful. He's, yeah. he's, so um, if, I love that. So, yeah. There's a there's a lot of fun because there's no money in it. So why not do whatever you want? Yeah, that's so cool. I love it. I feel like that's like a like a good mindset to approach fiction, maybe in general. Even hey, everyone in a listening, market. if there are any publishers out there, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I know, love it. I love it. Let people I wanna, experiment I, more. Yeah, right. Let's all do more fun <laughs> things with books. Speaking of doing fun things with books, I want to talk about your books a little bit. Um, okay, yeah. So how did it feel when you published your your first book? Um, so entering that wild world of traditional publishing, uh, what was that experience like for you? Well, I should say that, that it was published with Tor. Tor has been wonderful to me. But I w- and they did their best to, to make me feel comfortable and make sure I was understood the process. And I was such a bundle of nerves that there's a book <laughs> um, called The Writer's Book of Doubt. Um, and it's edited by Aidan Doyle. And it's really a wonderful book, but it's about all of the things that writers worry about. So I thought, well, you know, I'm very worried, so I'll pick it up like a comfort book. And no, it was like a hypochondriac reading a set no. of symptoms. I had to put it aside. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it gave you 50 <laughs> new things to worry about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, no. So it's a really great book. I've read it since. I but, was going to uh, say, I was going to take note of it because I'm always really well, nervous. I, I wrote it down. I was like, I'm going to put that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, it, but it turned out nice and everything, everything was fine. But it was um, because, I mean, it's a book about talking plants. How mm-hmm. is that going to work? And it worked out fine. It worked out great, in fact. And I think one of the things it did, like like I said, with the Spanish of taking just wild um, yeah. Uh, chances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So why not, well, take talking plants seriously? And, and um, I think I did the right thing. At the time, though, when it was coming out, I could think I was just terrified. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, especially having so much experience with different aspects of of this world in terms of, you know, you'd written like short stories before this and, and nonfiction and translation and all this different kind of stuff. And then, and I've done a lot of journalism with very, very exactly um, controversial topics, but this was hard. Talking plants, man. (laughs) But science fiction is a good realm to, to approach that kind of thing. And, and I think science fiction readers have that um, within their interests and, and within the books that attract them this um, desire to read about things that might be just overtly strange and, yeah, and hard to hungry. comprehend. Yeah, hungry they're hungry to, for that. to suspend reality a little bit. I mm. think that's what we're looking suspension for. Right? Of, suspension of disbelief it. was the term that I there was There it like, is. You're welcome, Adrian. I got you. See, Thanks, well, I'm your Andrew. co-pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. And, 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 but I was aware that even if I wrote a good book, which I didn't, I hope, but I didn't know. There are a bazillion great books out there. So I was up against some tough competition. Mm-hmm. I still yeah. am. But that that's kind of the, I mean, that's a good thing. To, yeah, because like, I can't write very fast. So I want readers to be busy while I'm not, not. <laughs> so they need to have a lot of other good things they can read so that when I get my next book out, they're still in the habit of reading. That's I a love very that. lovely way to think about it. Because most people would be like, oh, I got to write fast, fast, fast. So like they don't get, you know, to forget about dr- me. Yeah, yeah. Forget about me or drawn to other people's work. It's like, no, let's share it all around people. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's have I love, love it. For it's everybody. not a zero sum game. It's all, <laughs> exactly. everybody wins. I love that. 
We're a community, man. We are, um, though. And so in the case of Semiosis, you've mentioned talking plants. How did you come up with the idea for that novel? And what appealed to you about, you know, approaching this, this topic of like a sentient species and uh, the way that we as humans think about communication in relation to other species or, you know, things like plants and, and then kind of combining that with this really cool, like first contact kind of element. Well, I know exactly how it started and that I have a lot of houseplants. I still do. And one day I realized that one of my houseplants had killed another one of my houseplants. Cool. And at first I felt kind of bad because I should have been paying more attention. Um, but it was a vine and it grew around the other one and shadowed it and the plant died of starvation. And then I had another plant like a month later that tried to sink a root into an, its neighbor and I, then I thought, well, there might be a, um, a pattern going on. So I started to do some research, and I discovered that plants are horrible. They're murderous. They're in <laughs> terrible competition with each other. They will kill each other over sunshine, happily. Um, uh, roses. You think roses. Why do roses have thorns? We're always asking, poets always wonder about this. I know. Um, because <laughs> the way a ro wild roses grow is they're sort of floppy. So they grow up and then they flop over. Mm -hmm. And they use the thorns to dig into the plants around them so that they can hold on to those plants and to kin continue to grow upward. And whatever <laughs> might be under them, and maybe it starves and dies because it can't get sunlight anymore. Well, that's just too bad. Damn. Oh roses okay. are, are brutal. <laughs> Sue, quick aside. I have a rose plant in my backyard next to a blackberry bush. Good fucking luck. Oh, thorns man. on thorns. There is <laughs> warfare in your backyard. Boom. Set up um, a time lapse camera and just have the <laughs> slowest war of all time. <laughs> yeah, these plants look like thorn in each other. <laughs> That's um, so, so interesting, though. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so plants do that. They do a lot of other things because they have to compete. They're, um, there's just not enough sunlight on this planet. Mm -hmm. um, and they never will be. So they compete for that. They compete for other things. Obviously, carnivorous plants um, need can't get everything they need from the soil, so they, like, eat us. Um, and there's a lot of them that we didn't even realize were carnivorous. We thought they were just killing bugs for fun, um, <laughs> and which some apparently do anyway. So they do all of these things. They have a lot of skills. Um, they can make chemicals if, if there's, like, like um, uh, caterpillars on them. They can make chemicals that will call wasps that will eat the caterpillars. Dude, wow. Um, that is so every cool. time, yeah, the, this is a good time to be in plant, um, uh, research because they keep discovering all of these things as plants do, but okay. So fine. Plants are horrible. They're dangerous. They're <laughs> powerful. And um, interesting. they're very aggressive. Um, we think they, they just grow there. No, they're, they're, they're trying to take over their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're also. There's a lot of debate about whether or not they actually think, and I'm, I've made a uh, science fictional decision. But what we do know is that they know that there's something out there. Mm -hmm. um, that's why they make flowers, and they understand pretty much how that works. Um, but plants do communicate with us. What, if you have tomatoes, and the tomatoes turn red, what does that tell you? Well, the tomato wants you to eat their fruit because raw tomato seeds can go right through us and then they come out and then they might be in a good place to grow and they have fertilizer. So they want you to eat that tomato. So they tell you when the tomato should be eaten, that it's ripe and it's ready for you. It's tasty. Mm -hmm. So plants do communicate with us. So knowing that all that, my question was now, what if they could actually think like us and not think like plants? And how could I make a story around that? And I figured, well, another planet would actually be the best place for that. Mm -hmm. um, then experimented with that in a whole bunch of different ways. And eventually some humans show up 
And bit by bit, they realize what they got themselves into. It's like sentient species versus sentient species. Right. <laughs> or cooperative, because plants, I, I told you how horrible they are, but they do cooperate as well. <laughs> um, and even different species work out ways that they can be stronger together. Mm-hmm. MJ knows that I'm obsessed with fungi. And that's kind I of do. like my obsession. And so yeah. I do. I'm weary. No. Oh, so fungus are, are fungus. <laughs> yeah. a lot more scary. Um, but oh, the thing is, we don't know yeah. very much about fungus. Exactly. Because there yeah. are fungus in book three. And so I was doing some research and we don't even <laughs> know what's out there. Yeah. We no, don't even know they're... what's in me because there's fungus in our bodies. Exactly. And it's our living microbiomes. and it's doing just fine. But we yeah. don't really know very much about it. Exactly. We don't even, it might even be necessary. We, what do we know? <laughs> yeah, but it's so cool because it's like the ways that plants and fungi communicate and the way that they benefit each other. And obviously it's like with us too, we have the fungi living inside us that help our, di- our digestive system to process different foods. There's probably mm-hmm. fungi out there who are like, hell yeah, McDonald's and other ones who are just like, <laughs> please eat more vegetables and like fresh food and stuff. So it's really interesting to... I think my stomach fungi are the McDonald's kind. <laughs> McDonald's and Coke, baby. They're, they're, here <laughs> they're for suffering, me. MJ. <laughs> well, there's there's more microorganisms in your gut than there are cells in your entire body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or so, like planet planets in the universe. Or so like yeah, star, I've got my little zoo and uh... <laughs> <laughs> my precious little zoo. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> so moving away from the topic of stomach zoos before it freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> Deal with it, MJ. We're science fiction writers. Your fantasy. <laughs> go off to fantasy land. Right. <laughs> no, I know. Let's go back to my fantasy land where there's swords and wizards and stuff. Um, so <laughs> after Semiosis <laughs> and the sequel, Interference, you wrote Immunity Index, which tackles some pretty heavy topics that <laughs> I think all of us are pretty intimately familiar with now. Outbreaks, pandemics, government mm. control, genetics, all that stuff. Um, so what was your thought process like while writing that book? And how do you feel about that all in hindsight after going through the events of 2020 and beyond? Um, well, when I started writing that, um, I thought, well, uh, coronavirus is a really a very interesting virus. And it would be interesting if on top of all of the other things uh, that I was, was, was in there with genetics and that is, okay, so we'll have a coronavirus uh, um, epidemic. And then what happened was that there was a, as I was finishing it up, which was really terrifying because I'd done a lot of research into it mm-hmm. and I knew all of the things that could go wrong. Uh, we got off light. There's uh, relative to what could have happened. Um, but that and other things. I've I've always been very interested in politics. Well, I was a journalist for a long time, and you cover politics pretty intimately. Um, and some people have said it was a dystopia, and maybe it is. But, but if you're alive now, I will be willing to argue that you are in a dystopia. Um, at least some of us. If you're homeless mm-hmm. right now, this is a horrible time. Um, so... If you looked at things from that direction, what's going on in real life that is is pretty much a dystopia, Um, and then some more things, and pretty soon people say it was a thriller, and maybe so. Um, All of these elements together would feed off each other, and, and I thought would, well, developed into a good story. Um, yeah. my initial processes for writing is, is, I don't think I'm a pantser, but there's a lot of pantsing going on. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have that journalism background, which I imagine does help to kind of embed you in, um, the reality of the world that you want to create. It's like the reality of unreality in this weird paradoxical way, but, um, at least to give you some footing to build off of and say like, okay, we're going to be writing about coronaviruses. We're going to be writing about et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I've spoken to you about this in terms of, uh, this was just like via email that like, 
you never really sought out to write thrillers, but your books end up being kind of lumped into this like sci-fi thriller space. Um, I think it just comes down to the sort of topics that you tackle, but also the way that you pace your stories and that kind of thing. But do you feel like that sort of genre, subgenre, however you view it, is an effective method of, at least for you, playing around with big ideas like the ones that we discussed in a way that it's like, I feel satisfied being able to like dig into this and provide people with like a really fun, sometimes scary, thrilling narrative that gets them engaged and, and, and uh, enjoying what they're reading, but also like connecting with these broader societal ideas. Well, I think, yeah, the, the question is not the ideas, but what do the ideas mean to people? Mm-hmm. And so if you have someone living through a very difficult time, um, the ideas that they come up against um, and the situations that they find themselves in will be very revealing. And so it's a good way to look at that. I mean, it's just as one passing thing, which is, has really turned into a dystopia, is that it? there's a very brief mention in Immunity Index that access to birth control was had become very difficult. Mm-hmm. Well, that's happening now. Yeah. Um, my my um, my agent has decided I can predict the future, um, <laughs> and I'm not happy about that. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like a. But, ch- but even when I was like, writing no, it, I could no. see that that things were moving in that direction. Right. Mm-hmm. And for anyone listening outside of the United States, go search up and you're going to go down a really fucked up rabbit hole of like the situation in terms of birth control and Planned Parenthood and all this different kind of stuff. We're in the doing United great States. here in the U S yeah. we're doing great. You're, you're having a fun time. A fun it's a time. Great well, time. And, and I was also writing this during the Trump presidency Yeah, and I'm, I would submit to some extent we were sort of living in a thriller in that every time I checked the news and it didn't matter how often something was happening. Oh my True. gosh. Right. True. Yeah. Um, well, I'm uh, I'm Canadian living in Ecuador, so I'm. <laughs> <laughs> You're like I'm a step removed from all that. Yeah. Jazz. But then I just I just like make myself suffer and and like to keep up on world politics, and it's like oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> you oh. just care about all your poor U.S. friends. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So just want to help you any way I can, MJ. Yeah, you want to help. You want to be some emotional support for us. Yeah. Um. So speaking of some of those big ideas, let's talk a little bit about your newest book, Dual Memory. Um, so I'm curious about what are the origins of this novel? How did it take shape for you? Well, I'm interested in plants. And then I thought about the um, tulip mania mm-hmm. and did some research into that. And what I discovered that everything you think you know about that is probably wrong. Um <laughs> What really happened was very different. Um, You hear that people lost a lot of money. No, they didn't. Um, You hear that the prices spiked up. Well, yeah, they did. Some guys got drunk one night in a tavern and they did really stupid stuff. But they didn't actually own the tulips they were selling and they didn't have the money that they were saying they were going to buy it for because they were drunk. and so they sobered up and um, the paperwork was there, but no one actually did anything with it. Um, but they were dealing with, with uh, tulips and, and it was actually a good investment at the time, with the exception of that one drunk moment. Um, prices were pretty good. To give you an example, right now, you can pay $10,000 for a tulip bulb today. And it would be a good investment if you're a plant nursery, because you're just going to breed that thing and make all your money back. Mm. And that was essentially kind of what they were doing. These were just investments. These were some very rich people. But they were not the people in charge of Amsterdam where they lived. And the people in charge of Amsterdam were very pertinent. And these people were just getting drunk and doing stupid things and... um, (laughs) They told the story of what happened, and that's why you think a lot of bad things happen when it was actually pretty reasonable. So I had the idea that there's a, a 
the story you think is happening, and then there's the real story. Mm. Um, and then started to work with that. Um, other things that were going on during the tulip bubble, there was a war. This was a 30 years war, which is a really horrible war. For context, uh, uh, this was in Holland in like the 1600s. 1630s. Yeah. And so there was a, there was a war. There was actually the plague. But I was like so done with epidemics, um, so I was just, like, I no kind more. of yeah, I, I didn't of me, yeah. didn't have a real epidemic because I couldn't stand it anymore. Um, <laughs> and um, then the people in charge were very different from the people who had money, who were actually somewhat different from the people who knew what was going on. And then they had a bunch of artists just the were painting pictures of tulips because they were making good money doing that. And artists weren't stupid. Um, so tried to put that all together into a story set in the future and things. So, no things. tulips, but <laughs> what if we had alien life forms and people were trading that the way that they were trading tulips at the time? And then what could go wrong with that? Well, we had some examples. Um, and so that was the birth of it, was that there was an incident in history that was actually quite complex. And what mm -hmm. could I do with those elements? Yeah, and taking those elements and kind of playing with the dual memory and the dual stories mm -hmm. that were being told. And I love how you set. obviously it's like you mentioned, you set this in the future. This is set on Earth in an Arctic colony of what I would kind of say like different socioeconomic castes from the aristocrats who are the people who are buying and selling and trading all of these uh, extraterrestrial life forms in a very just like egregiously recreational way. And then all the people who make the island run uh, and then different kind of, kinds of like subterfuge in terms of, you know, there's like uh, raiders who sail the seas and, and, and raid, uh, different ports 30 years war. Yeah. Get. Um, yeah, exactly. So you got, you got your war in there. Screw the pandemic. You got your war in there. So that's good. Um, <laughs> I was curious from your perspective, it's like setting it on the, on this Arctic Island and, and kind of developing this community. How is that like a good framework for you to obviously comment on this, this historical event, the, um, with tulip mania and everything like that, but also to kind of play with ideas that and 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 things that we're dealing with today whether it's like climate change or whether it's like economic um you know just just stark economic difference and and all the social and political problems that we're dealing with and all that kind of thing the reason for the island is is something that that science fiction writers in general have a problem or something they have to deal with now, is mm -hmm. that it's very easy to get from here to there. I could be in London tomorrow morning if I really wanted. Right. Um, but, and that means the kinds of stories that you can tell are different. I can also talk to anyone you what in Ecuador. Um, yep. And I'm talking to you right now. Um, so all of this ease of communication and ease of travel affects the kind of story you can tell. Mm -hmm. In some good ways and in some bad ways. But if I wanted to reproduce this one, at the time, if you wanted to get leave Amsterdam, well, you had to get on a horse and go clomping off or walk. Actually, a lot of people walked back then. Yeah. And so you couldn't get anywhere very fast. So it was a pretty close society compared to what Amsterdam is right now. Mm -hmm. um, but if I put it on an island, then we have some closure to that place. And everyone has to relate to each other because they re can't really go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so that could recreate some of the social structure that that they had at the time. Um, and the weather. Um, well, Thule is an actual mythological place, which we know to be somewhere up in the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and but that gave a, a chance to talk about what what a difficult environment would mean for people and the ways yeah. that it could protect them, too, because it had been a protection for the island for a long time. Yeah. And it's like everyone knows each other, this mm -hmm. insular community. 
So like if shit goes down, everybody knows, people <laughs> it's talk. Going down for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you you also mentioned the artist aspect where there were like the the artists who were taking advantage of tulip mania and were painting tulips and selling their paintings for for a pretty nice profit. But in the case of dual memory, you have this intersection of art and the artists and and people as artists with technology. So, what are your thoughts on on this sort of this sort of intersection? And then at the same time, do you have any thoughts on artificial intelligence and the role of the artist, whether that's a person or whether that's an AI, especially with like recent trends from like, you know, you're published by Tor. So it's like, there's like some stuff going on with like AI created art covers and, and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, well, I studied art very briefly, um, but enough to, to be dangerous. And <laughs> um, art has always worked with technology um mm-hmm. oil paintings for example when they were were created and perfected that changed the kind of art that that painters could make because it was a very flexible medium um photography when that was perfected well we see that now we're all ph- photographers now and we all have a lot of fun with that but that has changed what other kinds of art can do mm-hmm. because now its job is not just to to uh, record reality as it is, but to explore reality. Yeah. So now that you can do things with computer art, computers and art in all sorts of different ways, that is changing art as well um, and changing what people do. The thing is, though, um, what they call an AI right now is just basically an adding machine. You and I as human beings have a relationship with the universe and a direct relationship with the universe. Um, An AI just has a bunch of math, and then it tries to build things out of the math. And for a lot of reasons, it doesn't have a full picture of what it's doing either, which is why they hallucinate, because they don't know. (laughs) They don't know what they don't know, and they have no means to... Go back to the universe and see, is this actually possible? Mm. You and I are, are constrained because we, we know what's true and what's false. They have no conception of that very idea. And so because of that, um, the AIs are just spitting out what we give them. And it's really cute because they sound just like us. It's like a parrot that can talk. Oh, my God. It's so cute. (laughs) And I think we get carried away with that, um, that they sound like us, so they must be like us. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. They just imitate us poorly. Yeah, it's like the, the anthropomorphization that we give to animals. We also give to AI. And... You know, like all this talk of right now about like chat GPT and it's like, I've been talking with my brother-in-law about it because he's been using it. And I mentioned this to MJ about he's using it to write blog posts for his parents' hostel in, on the Galapagos Islands. And so he's using it as like an efficiency tool, essentially, where it's like, it only produces what he wants to feed it. And it just streamlines his it just mashes together a bunch of words and then he has to refine it and tweak it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then That's, keep that process going until you have something at my day use. job. We're, yeah. we're using it to, to conceptualize blog posts and stuff. And the people at my day job know that I'm also a novelist. And so they're like, Ooh, are you worried about AI generated books? And I'm like, no, <laughs> at <laughs> no. this point in time, it's not, not creative really. enough. <laughs> Cause I've mean, seen what it puts out and it, it needs a little human touch. <laughs> And they use it in translation, and you can get some um, paid kinds of AI translators that can do some Mm -hmm. really, really good work um, and tweak them in all sorts of ways, and it's excellent. But um, in the end, it's at best mediocre. Um, And for some stuff, mediocrity is just fine. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But if you want to do something that is fully human, you right. need to have that relationship with the universe that informs what you're doing, and they can't do that. Agreed. Yeah. 
I but don't they're... think that they will, because in the end, they're not alive and we are. Yeah. And like you said, it's like an imitation of us. And so whatever we're scared of, it's like mm. we're just scared of ourselves at that point. It's like <laughs> we're scared of what we can do as humans. And it's just to because be it fair, beca- humans it's coming are through. terrifying. <laughs> They're really terrifying. It's <laughs> right. just coming through. It's coming through in like a package that we're still a bit unfamiliar with. And therefore right. that that mystery scares the hell out of us. It's like. Well, and it, of like yeah. what's over the other side of that mountain. I haven't gone over there yet. Something could be over there that can kill me. Well, yeah. and but I think that's good because it is a powerful tool. Yes. And you know, it's a double-edged sword. You're right to be afraid if someone swings a sword at you. And <laughs> you could use an AI as a weapon too, and they have. I mean, it already is. And yeah. we can't put that genie back in the bottle either. Right? No. Now we just got to write good science fiction stories about how to properly. <laughs> how to defeat it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but then we'll give all the AI the ideas. But That's and, and, the most well, one of their the, the the board <laughs> stories that was nominated for a Hugo. Let me see if I can find that. Um, you can actually read this on the internet. Let me. F- um, Murder by Pixel. Crime and Responsibility in the Digital Darkness by S.L. Wang. It's in Clark's World, and it was published in December of 2022. And it's about whether or not an AI, being a machine, can actually become a murderer. Wow. Well, and, S.L. Wang is a, is a great author. So oh, yeah. I'm check that out. And the, well the story is told like a magazine article, and I was reading it, and I'm going, but this is true right now. Right? Um, <laughs> You're like, I'm scared. <laughs> So, and then Ninja comes in and says, defeat it. So, yes, Murder by Pixel, S.L. Wang, Clark's World, December 2022. And I recommend it because I want you to be able to read good things because I don't write fast enough. And also, it's a terrifying story. <laughs> cool. I will link to that one for sure. Well, speaking of great science fiction, uh, what is next for you? I know you mentioned working on book three in Semiosis series, but do you have anything else on the horizon? Or can you tell us a little bit more about book three? Whatever you got for us. Let's see. Book three, it's the um, the finish, the finish the final book in the trilogy. And it's not a spoiler to say that the rainbow bamboo, these talking plants, are on Earth and they want to take over. And they're a fungi. <laughs> well, they're not sure if they should, um, but maybe they should, and maybe then things happen. Um, a lot of things happen. There's some fast-moving chapters in this book. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, a variety of short fiction, translations, I don't know. I list them all on my website because um, I get the confused. Um, and... I even actually have a a, a, a science fic, a, a, um, a, a fantasy story coming out in cool. um, by being published by New Myths in an anthology, nice. and it's uh, the Virgin who rescues dragons. Cool. But it's all about someone. Uh, she lives in in um, uh, such a series of tropes that she and she keeps taking them over. It's always lots of fun. <laughs> I oh, love that. Just subvert them left and right. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Well, uh, to close out, can you give listeners and viewers, A, a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and B, you've already told us a ton of weird and random facts, but if you could tell us another weird or random fact that you find <laughs> to be utterly fascinating. We're greedy. We want all the random facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my advice is to be bold. Um, the this the more you try to do something new and different and experimental and with your whole mind that's you being direct with the universe um rather than maybe not intentionally just filing off the serial number of someone else's universe invent mm-hmm. your own um so be bold take chances take risks it will get you to wonderful places a weird random fact. I actually heard this from Stephen Jay Gould, who was a um, a scientist, 
And he argued that we are living in the golden age of bacteria. And then he had charts that showed that wow. over a period of time, the variety and species of bacteria has been growing very, very steadily and faster than the rest of us, rest of the animals. <laughs> oh, the no. things that are running this planet right now are bacteria because uh, there's uh, uncounted variety. Um, there's more of them than ever. They can do more things than ever. And they're in charge of this planet. <laughs> my hypochondriac Brilliant. ass hates that. Thank you. Speaking, speaking <laughs> well, of there's little, a bunch like, of them in my little zoo. intestinal zoo. Right there. in our tummy yeah. zoos. <laughs> Mine are eating McDonald's. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, just sugar and salt, MJ. I love that. <laughs> So that I run on. It's very brilliant. healthy. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for chatting with us today as well. For anyone who contributes $10 or more to our Patreon, there will be an exclusive reading by Sue from Dual Memory. So go check that out. Uh, Sue, where can, fo- can you let folks know where they can find you on social media? Um, well, the easiest place to find me, I have a web page. It's called Sue Burke, one word, dot site, S-I-T-E. And then it has links to everything, and I update it very rarely with whatever thought is going through my head at the time, right and on. links to whatever I might be doing. All the short stories, all the articles mm. and everything are all on there. All right, Love and it. you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram and Twitter at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, where can people find you? You can find me across all the major socials, so Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word. Brilliant. All right. So that is it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Sue to hear our mini masterclass on revision and rewriting. I'm so excited for that. Now keep reading, keep imagining, and see you next time on SFF Addicts.